Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, it's true, the word death does appear several times on the first page of Ocean Gate's three-page waiver that all mission specialists had to sign. As a matter of fact, the word death appears four times on page one, not three, and there are another three references to death on page two, and then a final if I die reference on the third and final page. So all in all, basically eight references to death or dying across two and a half pages. Are you out of your fucking mind? Is that going to be enough to protect Ocean Gate from ruinous lawsuits? Let's take a look. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Welcome to the several thousand of you who have subscribed. I'll be doing a follow-up on this because it's a legal document with an analysis of what the legal case is in terms of maritime law. I have studied law. Maritime law is not exactly my wheelhouse. It's not really my area of expertise, but we'll definitely go into it. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So, let's go through this document. Release of Liability Agreement. I, and then a space for your name, acknowledge that I voluntarily applied to participate in a submersible operation arranged by Ocean Gate Expeditions Limited, a company, and this is quite important, registered in the Bahamas. And so that is essentially where you would probably deal with any kind of litigation where the company is domiciled. The agreement continues. I've been informed about the nature of the operation and the risks it presents, including that. And that already is quite important. Have you been informed? When you were informed, what were you told? Anyway, number one, the operation includes activities involving subsurface vessels, surface vessels, and or remotely operated vehicles that are on, near, or under the water. Number two, a portion of the operation will be conducted inside an experimental submersible. There it is. The experimental submersible vessel has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and may be constructed of materials that have not been widely used in human-occupied submersibles. It's pretty incredible that point number two, right there in black and white, and near the very top of page one, acknowledges this experimental sub- submersible. In fact, it refers to it twice in point two. So let that put to rest any doubts you may still have about the company either not knowing or not saying anything about the risk of using an experimental untested or not fully tested uncertified craft. An excerpt from point number three reads, I understand that I may decline to participate in any dive below the ocean surface or any activity of the operation at any time. That's reassuring. So if the craft springs a leak or starts to snap and crackle, passengers are allowed to demand, I guess, to be allowed back to the surface. I wonder if that didn't happen on mission five. Point number four. These could become even more hazardous in heavy seas, obviously dangers. In addition, during the operation, I I may board small vessels and other equipment that could expose me to property damage, injury, disability, or death. Now, this excerpt from point four accepts that there may be serious property damage on a quote-unquote small vessel, especially a small vessel on heavy seas. It seems the founder... The creator of this craft seriously underestimated that risk of damage heavy seas might make to his small vessel. Number five, I will be exposed to risks associated with high pressure gases, pure oxygen servicing, high voltage electrical systems and other dangers. I have a bad feeling about this. What? Danger of flammable gases, being electrocuted or drowned? Sign me up. Number six, the operation will take place largely at a great distance from the nearest hospital or rescue personnel. That is quite easy to underestimate. In the end, the remoteness was both a factor and a non-factor. It was a factor, I believe, in how the towed platform and craft were 
worn down and its resilience potentially compromised or undermined in these long journeys, these long, you know, three, four hundred mile sorties this way and that over rough seas. A little bit like uh, taking a little kitten on a walk on a leash over miles and miles of railway tracks. I guess one could argue if they hadn't descended so far, so fast, they could potentially have saved themselves if the support ship wasn't so far away, if they hadn't put so much space, so much distance between themselves and the support ship. Going even a relatively short distance in terrestrial terms, say one mile or two miles, but going down, vertically down into the deep sea, just one or two miles, that is nevertheless a matter of going very far away and out of reach for most man-made craft, and that was the situation in this case. So, what do you think? Are OceanGate covered against lawsuits purely based in terms of the law and this document? I must say, it is pretty (laughs) dotting every legal dot and crossing every T. This document really does, uh, I think, it, it's about as ironclad as it could be given the situation they were in. The question is, is it going to protect them completely against every possible legal challenge? And so I'll be dealing with that aspect, maritime law and the wild west of international waters as a follow-up to this analysis. This is where things get really interesting, but also legally tricky for all involved. This is definitely turning into Rust 2.0. If you're unfamiliar with the Rust incident and my coverage of it, I have covered a similar type situation, but also more importantly, a legal question surrounding where you have a movie production and a series of incidents, and then whose responsibility is it when something goes wrong, or is it no one's responsibility? And so we are dealing with a legal path, a legal fabric that is intertextual to this one. There are several people, there are um, a series of circumstances that lead up to it, there's information that is known, and then there's also information that's not known. And one can also make the point that obviously no one in this case intended to kill anyone else. This is not classical true crime where there's a murder and there's a motive and someone um, tries to literally take someone else's life. That is not the issue here. But you can nevertheless have culpability even when it's unintentional. And that comes down to the question of willfulness. And that is what we're going to be examining in the follow-up analysis. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.